Welcome to the Portfolio Playbook, presented by Flex Networks, which is modernizing, simplifying, and revolutionizing the engagement experience between asset managers, wealth managers, and financial advisors. In each episode, we'll bring you valuable insights and perspectives from an array of key players in financial services and technology, including the ones you know already and the ones you should get to know. Tune in to hear what drives these firms as they create compelling offerings for today's markets. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to the Portfolio Playbook. I'm Wendy McConnell. Today we have a couple of guys with us from Innovative Portfolios. We have Dave Gilreath and Ron Brock, Managing Director of Innovative Portfolios. Thank you, fellas, and thank you for being here. Well, thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy, very much. So are you like co-managing directors? Yes, exactly. Uh, both are managing directors, so co-managing directors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just sounds so simple, right? Yeah. Well, we're we're fifty fifty partners, so there you go. All right. So tell me a little bit about innovative portfolios. Well, innovative uh, kind of spawned off of Sheath Brock, and Sheath Brock is our retail RIA, uh, which we manage about one point two billion for private clients, you know, individual accounts, basically. Um, and Chief Brock started about 21 years ago, 22 yeah, years about ago. Six weeks after 9 11. Yeah, our timing so, was fantastic. Yeah, we point out we're not market timers. So um, our spouses were really, really proud of us uh, jumping ship. Yeah. We were at Morgan Stanley at the time, and Dave and I decided to go independent and start our wow. own RIA. Yeah. And no one even had heard of an RIA then. And right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that, you got a question, you know, somebody is on your side there, right? Yeah, exactly. Especially since we uh, we asked our clients to move their money from Morgan Stanley to a little company called Waterhouse Securities, which no, no one had ever heard of, you know. Yeah. In TD Waterhouse. Anyway, so, but Innovative came off of that RIA because we basically wanted to take the strategies that we used for our regular clients, our private clients, and make them available for other advisors uh, because they work pretty well and we thought other people might want to use them. So that was the start. That was a genesis of, of Innovative. So you two came together then to uh, what was the uh, perfect situation and the ideal for the vision in your head when it started? Well, I don't know if it was perfect. <laughs> for, for Innovative or for Sheep no, Brock? For well, whatever led to the two of you coming together to do what you're doing. Well, we, we had met um, when I joined Dean Witter in 89 from uh, Prudential Beach Securities, and Dave was already at Dean Witter, uh, having joined in 84? 83, 84. And so I'd met Dave then. We were not partners at uh, Dean Witter, which evolved into Morgan Stanley, but uh, we worked uh in offices next to one another and shared ideas and became friends. Um, and, and he was most impressed by one of my uh, one of my nervous habits that I had because his office backed right up to my office, and I had a I was an early adopter to a stand up desk, and so I'd wear a headphone with long cord on it, you know, and talk to clients, and I'd yeah throw a tennis ball up against the wall all the time ah. while I was talking to people. Yes, if anybody ever seen this great escape, Steve McQueen would bounce a baseball against solitary confinement against the wall when he was in the cooler. And Dave would do that. And my wall shared his and my desk faced his. And I'd be on the phone with clients and it'd go thump, thump, <laughs> thump. I had a wireless headset. I'd walk around the corner and I'd just go, really, Dave? <laughs> thump, thump, thump. So Dave. anyway, that's uh, when uh, we decided to start the RIA, we both we knew each other, although we were not partners at Morgan Stanley. Was there but, agreement that there would be no tennis ball tossing in the new situation? Well, we put about two offices between Dave's and mine, so it didn't matter at that point. <laughs> He's somebody else's problem now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me a little bit about, why don't we start with you, Dave, about what inspired you to get into this industry? 
Well, I had a fascination with the stock market. I remember sitting and watching Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser with my dad on Friday nights as he would have a scotch and water and I'd drink a you know Diet Coke or something uh, when I was like in high school. And even in college and like starting in maybe 1977, I had a small brokerage account and I would sell covered calls in it. And so this was like four years option after options even started. Um, and my first job was a salesman, corrugated box salesman, and my wife worked in a brokerage office. And so I decided to take a class that her manager was running, like a six-week investment class, you know. And at the end of the class, this was in Evansville, Indiana, and and at the end of the class, I was like, I think I like your job better than my job. And so <laughs> I decided to move to Indianapolis and become a stockbroker, you know, which is a, a term from the old days. Um but that's what got me into the investment business to begin with. Okay. And never look back, right? No, actually, no, actually no. no. No, I had a you know wife and eventually kids, and there's no turning back at that point. No, you need the money, right? <laughs> okay, Ron, what about you? How did you get your start? You know, it's kind of interesting. It's not totally dissimilar from Dave's. Uh, my dad and I would chart stocks in junior high school and high school. Uh, and I always found it interesting to... I can remember one of the stocks we uh, charted in uh, the late 60s, early 70s was Anaconda Copper, which was a gigantic company at the time, which is now defunct. And then uh, in college, uh, I ran a disco, uh, a bar at IU in Bloomington in the height of disco mania. And one of my uh, friends, a bartender, uh, who's now very successful up in Chicago in this industry, uh, left, graduated a year before I, and uh, went to an Indianapolis brokerage firm. And I said, right out of college, went right into a brokerage firm. And I talked to him about it. And so I began interviewing. And uh, after a few years, landed a job with the Prudential Bates Securities. And uh, haven't looked back since either. And uh, spent a few years there, then worked over to Dean Witter, which worked into Morgan Stanley. Then Dave started uh, talking about this RIA concept, which I'd never heard of, and neither had anybody else. And Sound like a pretty good idea. Uh, my father was really proud of me. We had I had a one year old at home, I think, at the time, or mm -hmm. two year old at the time, and quit Morgan Stanley, which was pretty stable, to go out on my own. And uh, this worked out pretty well. It's worked out. And how long have you guys been together in this business? Uh, twenty. This is the twenty second year. Yeah, I think it's worked out. I yeah. Think yeah, <laughs> I have you know, it was a it was a risk at the time because nobody had heard of an RIA, right? And we went we went from a straight commission, you know, compensation method to fee only like oh, overnight, right. and every, all everybody's oh your clients will never go for paying a fee, and none of them cared at all. They knew we were getting paid somehow, so they didn't care. You know, right? Yeah, Dave came up with this great idea of a T chart, like the old Ben Franklin T chart. He said, "Here's because we could." We could uh, print out a client statement at Morgan Stanley. It would be the YTB, the yield to broker, or what they were getting, what they're paying annually. And uh, you could just say, here's what you're paying currently, and here's what it's going to cost to move with us in complete transparency. And they said, well, sure, we'll, we'll move with you guys. Uh, yeah. The relationship's with you to begin with. Um, and we were surprised, actually, uh, and quite honestly, and uh, we've told our friends at Morgan Stanley, this is the fact that we thought we probably had a large part of our client's wallet. And it turned out that we did not. Uh, we got over on this side of the business where we had complete transparency with fee only. We were, and people realized we weren't trying to sell them anything at that point on the fee only relationship. And all of a sudden, all these little accounts started showing up, all this other money started showing up. And our clients had a lot more money than we thought they had. And then they'd start talking to us about it. Um, and it was a much better relationship for us and for the client. Hey, this is Brian Moran, the CEO and founder of Flex Networks. Thank you for listening to the Portfolio Playbook. If you have any questions about a manager or firm featured on the show or about Flex's platform, please head over to www.flxnetworks.com or take a look at the show notes to find out how to reach me and my team. We would love to hear from you. What is it that 
you prefer when it comes to the IRA? Um, I would say the transparency, to be honest. Okay. The, the, the fact that a client is more open to you because we're not, you know, we can tell them up front, hey, we don't, we're not going to get your 401k. We know that. So, but tell us what's in there so we can model what you're doing over here with that, you know, see how they, they match up. Um, I think it also allows you to be a little more uh, focused on what you're doing because you can concentrate on a certain area and you don't have a manager, you know, beating your head saying, hey, you got to sell more of this and more of that or, you know. So and the, and I know the, bro the brokerage business is different today than it was back then. Right. right? But even still, um, it, it allows you to, to you know, chart your own course and do what you like to do versus what somebody else wants you to do. Well, the relationship is better because at the onset, they they know what they're paying you. So when you have a discussion with them about their account, they know that you're not trying to move them from one thing to another because it's in your best interest. They know it's because it's in their best interest because it doesn't affect us. Uh, when they do better, we do better, and they get that. If the only reason we're talking to them is to improve their account, uh, it's it's everything's for their best interest. So the trust is not something that's an issue when it can be Absolutely. in other situations. That's right. exactly it. exactly okay. So what would you say some of the biggest challenges facing the industry right now? What are some of those biggest challenges? Um, well, in my opinion, the challenges facing the RIA business is, I think, the commoditization, I would call it, of advice, where a lot of um, RIAs are planners that are asset allocators, and so they all use the same, you know, three or four different software products to come up with a plan and then allocate assets in different funds and ETFs and whatever it is, um, and that in my opinion, there's not enough, you can't differentiate yourself enough that way. And so you end up fighting the battle of the fee compression where there's pressure to, you know, lower your fee because I can go over here to this planner and do the same kind yeah, of thing. No one's different enough um, from one shop to the next uh, because everybody's doing the same thing, using the same software, um, and ended up with the same results using the same big gigantic Vanguard funds or the same gigantic ETFs. Right. So I, th I think you kind of have to be different uh, and you have to focus on something. And that's basically what we did with our RIA. We focused on U.S. domestic equities, preferred stocks, REITs, and options. And it's like, we're not trying to be all things, all people. If you want an annuity or if you want life insurance or whatever, you know, we're not the people. We don't do that. Or the big phone book financial plan. Yeah, or a big, I mean, we'll do financial plans for some people, but it's not, that's not what we like lead with, where you have to do a plan first and then we'll tell you what to do later. We're like, hey, we've got this great dividend strategy. You want to put some money into that? And then a client will say, yeah, that's great. And then we try to expand from there uh, and build a relationship in, in other, uh, other products or whatever you want to call it. We try to take an approach that's different from what everyone else is doing to try to set ourselves apart. And, and that's what all our, all our strategies pretty much are a little unique. I, I you have to be a little unique to work here as well. Yeah. A little odd, maybe. Odd. <laughs> yeah. But the, in the industry, the, in the RIA industry, the roll ups are, you know, there's aggregators all the time. We get a call literally every two or three weeks from private equity groups or, whatever, you know, roll, roll up, up people. Um, and, and the bigger and bigger an RIA gets, the more you have to fit in, the, you have to pigeonhole your business to fit what they want, you know, because you're no longer working for yourself. Now you're working for XYZ Corp, you know, or this private equity group that wants to, in seven years, flip you to somebody else. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's good because it kind of legitimizes the model of the RIA, the, the bigger like the the Fishers and the uh, creative planning, creative plannings and, and, and Mercer and people like and that. And Beacon Point and all right. those people. The bigger those firms get, it kind of legitimizes the whole RIA space. Instead of having thousands of little shops on every street corner, 
people understand now what an RIA is. And then the other part of it is it allows us to be different than those shops because they're all doing the same thing and we are actually providing asset management. We're trying to provide what those people allocate to. Okay. Yeah. With with innovative, that's what we're attempting to do is, you know. Right. The management that they're trying. The, most of the shops are actually trying to allocate to managers. We want to be one of those managers that they allocate to. I see. Okay. So innovation uh, is part of your firm name. So what are some of the strategies or products that your firm currently offers and how that innovation filters down to the portfolios and products that you offer? It's a long question. That's a long question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to defer a little bit to our chief investment officer, who happens to be my business partner, Dave Gilry. <laughs> but we do, do, we do take an innovative approach, um, and that's why the name is Innovative Portfolios, and it is to provide um, innovative portfolios for intelligent advisors. Right. That's kind of our tagline. So one thing, I mean, we started you know doing cover calls years and years and years ago. I mean, back when... And, you know, the earth was still cooling kind of thing. But in, in our opinion, options get a bad rap. And most people, most advisors, most clients, many, will try to do anything they can to avoid volatility. And so one thing we do is we basically treat, and not only us, you know, a lot of people like Goldman Sachs treats volatility as an asset class. And if you are selling options, your batting average of success is incredibly high relative to buying options. And so we basically, in a lot of our strategies and a lot of the ones in the innovative portfolio side, are we're selling options and we sell puts and just repeatedly collect premium trying to monetize volatility, which is a, a concept that a lot of people don't quite wrap their heads around and, the, and and some advisors think options and all of a sudden it's like, oh, the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, one of the most famous investors who's a put seller. Yeah. And and we, we do put credit spreads and we do puts as well. But, uh, a lot of people equate volatility with risk and we, we don't do that. We, we don't think volatility is risk. We don't think risk is volatility. We think, uh, they're completely separate. As Dave said, volatility is an asset class that you can profit from. Yeah. And even like Warren Buffett, is, he's got a lot of written material about how volatility and risk are two different things. And most clients equate and most business schools equate volatility with risk, but but they're completely different. I mean, if you can, risk is where you have the chance of complete failure of losing your money or losing your or life product. or whatever, yeah. you know, um, whereas volatility is just a byproduct of the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't, if you, if you can't stand volatility, you shouldn't invest in equity to begin with, in my opinion. Well, so that's true. Anything, you know, just put your money in the bank and call it a day. It doesn't go straight up. No, it the doesn't market. go straight up. No, so, but we're, we're being forced, though, to kind of invest at this point. So, you know. People are afraid to not invest, but they're afraid to invest. Yeah, but if if you, as you know, we do a lot of work trying to educate people to make sure that they understand that you know, look, if you're if you're doing this for like a two or three year period of time, just don't even do it. I mean, you, okay. this is a long term thing, yeah. and the longer you you stretch out the the length of time you're willing to invest, the more likely it is you're going to make money doing it. So, and and like in the Selling the puts, we mostly, especially on in the innovative side, we sell puts on the S and P 500 because over time that chart goes up, you know, from left mm -hmm. to right, and yeah, there's bumps in between, but the S and P won't go out of business. I mean, that's the risk of selling a put is the company goes completely out of business. And if you sell puts on Silicon Valley Bank, you're you're toast, you know. But the S and P 500 doesn't go out of business, and it's constantly changing and evolving. Right. And getting stronger, really. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time in, in SMAs, and we've been able to add single-digit income over, over on top of another portfolio. Uh, but when you do that, you have to. When you're getting something, you got to give something up, and that giving up is you have to accept 
a little more volatility. And, and so some of our portfolios maybe have a little more volatility than other competitors. So when it comes to an ideal client, I guess Warren Buffett would be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, an ideal advisor would be one who recognizes the difference between volatility and risk and someone who would uh, be willing to explore uh, allocating to a, a, a different type of uh, investment or a different type of uh, product. Yeah, uh, somebody, one of our ETFs that uh, uses an option overlay as a part of uh, its strategy. Yeah, somebody willing to... Uh, try to profit from volatility instead of just hide from it. So, and we know that a client or a, an advisor is not going to put all of their money in our funds, and that's fine. We don't we don't need all our money, but for a sliver, if they're looking to to maybe outperform over time, put some of it into a like one of our ETFs, or we're coming out with a uh, a a use it a use it in Europe here shortly. Yep. We have a private fund that we do this kind of work in as well. Um, so we, you know, we've got a lot of different ways to do it. But you know, We don't see volatility slowing down. I mean, when we started in the business, it was they referred to uh, Wall Street Week with Louis Wukeyser. That was the financial news once a week on Fridays. And no one had a home computer. They subscribed to the Wall Street Journal. They go down to the local brokerage office and sit in a Merrill Lynch office or someplace with a cigar and watch that ticker. But now it's 24-7 financial news networks, multiple financial news networks. Everyone's got a home computer or their phone. They can pull up a quote or trade on their quote with Robinhood or somebody. They're in and out of the market in a heartbeat because of somebody posting something somewhere or they're watching TikToks about some sort of company. And so volatility is a product of all that financial news as well. Uh, good or bad, it's not going away. Uh, and the talking heads and all these financial news networks, uh, I don't know if it's helping people invest or if it's hindering them by confusing them. But with selling options, I mean, you really need three things that are constant and never, ever going away. And one's volatility that Ron just talked about. And the second is time. And the last is investor fear. And that that's not going away. No. 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 <laughs> so those things are just constant engines that are con continually driving option premiums that can be exploited by sellers of options. So. You mentioned all the changes that have happened over, you know, the last however many years. Uh, how do you see the industry evolving in the next few years? Um, well, I mean, first of all, the advisory business is a great business. That's why so many people are getting into it. And like uh, the brokerage firms are doing everything they can to keep their large teams there. But uh, it it is a rewarding business, but it's really challenging. Um, I it's think, not easy. It's no, I think the regulation is, or potential regulation that comes down all the time, is makes it harder. And maybe that's what's driving the roll-ups and things, because you know, people don't want to do all their own compliance or all, you know, all the stuff in the, in the background that you have to do. Um, yeah, the barriers to entry for a small RA or a small shop are, are growing. Uh, it'd be much more difficult for us to start. We started with like 65 million in assets and uh, Dave and I and two admins in 2001. It'd be a lot more difficult today to do it. Not that we couldn't get it done, but it would be much more difficult. And then we went through the, you know, the 08 and 09 financial meltdown, which uh, we had to reel it in big time. And it'd be really challenging for smaller shops. Uh, we had a couple hundred million at that time, a little shy of 300. And it was very challenging to watch your asset base when you're fee only, you know, shrink by 30% or so. Yeah. So the, the industry will evolve into bigger and bigger firms, but to me, that leaves open the opportunity for a creative kind of advisor to do something different and be different, and, right. you know, maybe we need to to regurgitate the old Volkswagen ad that was be different, you know, with a bug on there. <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about um, how you guys are different, so let's, you know, what is it that you think mostly sets your company apart from the others in the industry? 
Well, in my opinion, we're not index huggers, uh, and so far so good. I mean, I was reading the other day, uh, SPIVA, S-P-I-V-A, put out a study back in March 20th, and they went back 20 years and determined how many uh, in, how many active managers beat their index, beat their benchmark, and over 20 years, less than 20, less than 10% of domestic equity managers beat their benchmark. So, you know, 90% didn't beat it. And uh, there's a lot of other studies out there. It's about every year, it seems like it's about a third beat and two thirds don't beat. So we have two ETFs um, and they're both in their fifth year. So we start at the very end of 18. So they've got 19, 20, 21, 22, and so far in 23 under their belts. Um, and our, our dividend equity ETF has beat its benchmark, beat the market four out of five periods. So, you know, most managers are batting a hundred or batting 300 using a baseball analogy. And our equity ETF is at about batting 800 and our preferred stock income ETF has beaten about three out of five times mm -hmm. period. So it's batting about 600. Now that, that comes with the caveat that in 2022, market goes down, we go down even more, so our volatility is more on the downside. Uh, but if somebody's willing to accept that, uh, and even though our ETFs are still young, if you're willing to accept that, it shows me that long-term you can create alpha. Yeah. Uh, but you have to accept a little bit of volatility that comes along with that. So, Yeah, the ETFs were launched originally as uh, mutual funds, and we converted them a little over a year and a half ago to ETFs to uh, make them more readily available to the general public and to other advisors. Uh, and it's a better better instrument for clients and for advisors. Uh, it's got a lot of advantages in that format as an ETF. Yeah, cheaper fees, easier to buy. Right. Most places are no commission nowadays, so mm -hmm. you know, it's easy. So as we start to wrap up, is there something that I should have asked you that I didn't? Well, you could have asked us where could they find out more about Innovative Portfolios <laughs> and that could be at InnovativePortfolios.com. Well, I was going to get to that. All right. Well, you asked. No. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I, to me, advisors who... It's a great business, as I'd said before. I think somebody in this business needs patience and and they need a really strong stomach to go through the periods like Ron was talking about in 08, 09. Um, you need a, I think, a, like an unwavering belief in your strategy. Right. Uh, because it'll be challenged like all the time. Okay. <laughs> you, need, you need, I think you need to be, um, you know, upbeat and positive. Because every day you get barraged with bad news. I mean, I tell people when I started in the business, the Dow was at 875, and now it's at 33 or 4,000. Right. And every day I've woken up, there's been bad news, literally every day. So that just shows the power of capital markets, and, and you just got to be patient, though. Well, that's so. funny, because I, uh, I was talking about doing something or other, and my wife's going, oh, but we're going to a recession. I said, I've been in this business 38 years. When have you ever turned on the television or radio and you hear oh the market's great we're gonna have the economy is great it's going yeah. it's always bad there's news. no recession there's, no, there's never been a time when it's you, you set that aside yeah. it would be like the news coming on every day well it's yet another day with no recession yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. Or, or no problems no economic yeah. problems uh, no war in the middle east or <laughs> no problems in ukraine yeah uh, no starving children i mean there's always problems uh, but yet, as Dave pointed out, uh, in his career, uh, has doubled and the market's doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled again, and it will double once will again. again. Mm -hmm. As the economy keeps expanding, the market will expand. Ron, how do we get in touch with innovative portfolios? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> We can do that at InnovatePortfolios.com or info at InnovatePortfolios.com. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. I feel like I've learned a bundle of new stuff, and I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, Wendy, thanks. It's been a lot of fun. Thank yep, you. It's been great. Thanks. All right. So thank you for joining us as well. Please like, 
share and follow this podcast. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. Thank you for joining us on the Portfolio Playbook, where we bring you the latest insights and analysis from top firms in the financial and tech industry. We hope you found this episode informative and valuable in helping you better understand the strategies and approaches of these firms. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to tune in to our next episode for even more insights and perspectives from leading industry experts. For questions or to join Flex for free, visit our website at www.flxnetworks.com. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information contained in this recording is provided as is for educational and informational purposes only and should not serve as the basis for any trading or investing decisions. Flex Networks makes no representations and disclaims all express, implied, and statutory warranties of any kind to any viewer, listener, or other third party. Neither Flex Networks nor any of its affiliates make any endorsement of any particular company, security, product, or financial strategy, and nothing contained in this recording should be construed as investment advice. Investors should undertake their own due diligence and carefully evaluate companies before investing. Flex Networks is a promoter, as defined by the marketing rule, Rule 2064-1, under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940, of the investment products contained herein. For such promotion, Flex Networks is compensated between 5% and 40% annualized of the net management fee of the respective investment products on assets raised, serviced by Flex Networks. Flex Networks is not a client of any of the investment advisors promoted herein.